Well, good morning. My name is Paul, and I'm a staff member here at Stafford Baptist. If we've not met, I would love to meet uh, you after the service and, and get to know you on a more personal level, introduce myself on a more personal level. Uh, but this morning, uh, we get to uh, jump back into our series, continue in our series in 2 Corinthians. So if you have a Bible, or if you're using one of those pew Bibles there in front of you, you can turn to 2 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 7. If you're using the Pew Bible, you can find that on page 965. We said last week, as we started into chapter 2, that a new section starts, or as we were kind of going through chapter 2, a new section starts about midway through. Paul had been defending his travel plans and, and why he had sent the letter, but last week we saw kind of a turn to now defending his ministry. And really, as he's defending his ministry, he's, he's defending why he can speak boldly. And we saw last week that yeah, his boldness in his ministry is an effect of God making him sufficient for this kind of ministry. That it was not found in and of himself, but that God's grace makes him sufficient. But as he continues now into verses 7 through 18, we'll see that Paul will argue that not only does his boldness come because God makes him sufficient, but his boldness comes as he has a hope in the greater glory of the new covenant. That because Jesus has come and brought with him a way in which we now can see and know and gaze upon the glory of the Lord, Paul can be bold in his ministry. So with that in mind, let us turn to the text, verses 7 through 18 of 2 Corinthians 3. Hear the word of the Lord. Now if the ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, your word is both our delight and our counselor. We take great joy in your word, for it teaches and instructs us about who you are. Yet, Father, your word not only teaches and instructs, but, Father, it encourages, it exhorts, it comforts, it rebukes, it reproofs. So, Lord, we pray that we would find your word to be our greatest delight this morning. And that we would be counseled by your word, encouraged, exhorted, reproved, and rebuked where necessary. For your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning I have a question for us. Why can believers, why can Christians speak with boldness? This question really can work its way out in many kind of various questions. I've got two kind of applicational questions then to one to non-Christians and one for believers. If you're not a Christian this morning, but you're here, you've kind of come because you're, you're seeking to know God. I wonder if you've ever wondered why many Christians speak the gospel with boldness. Why they're unafraid to say uh, the talk of sin and death. 
and that Jesus is the only way. And maybe you are a Christian here. Well, I think as we think about this question, why can believers speak with boldness? I wonder if you are a, a Christian who struggles to speak with boldness. That maybe you, you, you are afraid, you struggle to, to talk about sin and, and death and, and Christ being the only way. You know, why can believers speak with boldness? Not in a presumptive or a brash way, but in a loving, truthful, and unashamed way way? Well, I, th I think our text this morning answers that quest those questions for us. As we said, Paul's defending his ministry, and really in defending his ministry, he's defending his bold talk that he, he gave in that severe letter that he wrote. It seems that the church at Corinth was, was struggling with it, and so Paul's going to defend his boldness. We see in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 4, Paul says, I am acting with great boldness toward you. It seems as if this great boldness was, was kind of causing the Corinthians problems, especially as they considered kind of the weakness and, and the affliction in which Paul experienced. But Paul defends his boldness, and as he does so, we get our main idea for this morning. As Paul defends his boldness, we see that the greater glory of the new covenant gives hope to believers that they may boldly proclaim the gospel as they are being transformed into the likeness of Jesus. That's quite a mouthful, so I'll, I'll say it again. The greater glory of the new covenant gives hope to believers with the purpose that they may then boldly proclaim the gospel as they're being transformed into the likeness of Jesus. And so as we, as we look to get to that main idea this morning, I have a two-point outline for us to kind of work our way to that main idea. First, in verses 7 through 12, we'll see our hope in a greater glory. Our hope in a greater glory. And then in verses 12 through 18, we'll see our boldness with unveiled face. Our boldness with unveiled face. Verse 12 really serving kind of as the linchpin to understanding our text this morning. So with that in mind, let us, let's look to, to verses 7 through 12 and see our hope in a greater glory, our hope in a greater glory. Well, as Paul begins in verse 7, what he's doing is he's picking up from the end of verse 6. So looking back to the end of verse 6, Paul writes, For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. It's important to note here that Paul wasn't intending for, uh, for someone hundreds of years later to start splitting up his text and preaching and kind of sermon here and a sermon there and a sermon there. He was intending for it to be read all at one time. And so it becomes clear that as he begins to talk about the ministry of death, that's coming right out of the language of the letter kills. But not only is the language very similar, but the idea that he begun in verse 6 of kind of contrasting the old covenant with the new covenant is now going to be fleshed out for us in verses 7 through 18. And Paul is going to do that by, by really teaching from Exodus 34, 29 through 35. Paul's going to defend his boldness and he's going to contrast the old covenant with the new covenant with his teaching from Exodus 34, 29 through 35. And in one sense, I get to just preach a sermon that Paul has already written and preached. So if we're going to, to rightly understand 2 Corinthians 3, we need to look back to Exodus 34, which we've read. But just to kind of recap what's been happening so in that story, Moses is receiving the Ten Commandments again after having broke the first tablets because he came down the mountain and the golden calf, uh, the, the people were worshiping the golden calf. And so he throws the tablets down in anger and, and kind of goes back up and pleads on behalf of the, the people of God interceding for them. Right? This is where Paul's, uh, Moses is hidden in the cleft right? because he had requested that, that God would show him his glory. The Lord told him he cannot see the fullness, but he can reveal some of himself. And so God did. And so Moses, having spent time in the presence of God, having talked with God, came down the mountain and his face was shining with this glory. So much so that as he's shining with his glory, the people are afraid, both probably a physical harm, just kind of it's so bright that their eyes may have, they may have feared going, going blind, but also spiritually and of seeing the glory of God, it, they knew of their sin and knew that seeing the glory of God would mean their end, their judgment. 
And so because of this, Moses would wear a veil when he wasn't in the presence of God. And so with that background, that will serve as we then turn to verse 7. And Paul begins to contrast kind of three separate times the Old Covenant with the New Covenant. So the the first comparison and and contraction happens in verses 7 through 8. Verses 7 through 8. And we see Paul describes the Old Covenant in this way. Now if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end. You know, it's important to note kind of how Paul describes the Old Covenant. It's the ministry of death. That would seem like a strange title for someone who we know holds a high view of of the law and of the Old Covenant. But, But remember, he's just said that the letter kills. And so Paul, picking up this language... Paul's not having a low view of the Old Covenant, but rather he recognized that the Old Covenant was a ministry of death because it it could not make people obey the covenant. Rather, uh, the participators were being condemned as they read the law because they could not obey the law. So it was a ministry of death, but it was was carved in letters on stone. That's referencing the, the Ten Commandments in the law. But we also see that the the Old Covenant was being brought to an end, right? So it was a temporary covenant, and that Paul's going to pick up on that in verse 11. And finally, we see that it has some glory. You know, Paul's not saying that the Old Covenant has no glory at all, but it came with some glory. But if it it came with some glory as the ministry of death, Paul, as he begins to describe the New Covenant, isn't the New Covenant even more glorious So as Paul's contrasting the Old Covenant with the New Covenant, he sees that the Old Covenant is a ministry of death, but the New Covenant is a ministry of the Spirit. Remember, verse 6, the Spirit gives life. We talked about how the Old Covenant could not uh, give us obedience, could not make us obey, but the Spirit can enable obedience. And in enabling obedience, it, it gives life and makes us righteous. And so will not the ministry marked by the Spirit have even more glory? as it's written on the hearts and not carved in letters on stone. So if the ministry of death had had glory, would not the ministry of the Spirit have more glory? Paul then answers this rhetorical question with his contrast in verse 9. For if, because there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, now the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. And so again, we see the comparison and contrast of of verse 9. The old covenant is described as the ministry that brings condemnation. It condemns us before God. But the new covenant brings righteousness. It's a ministry that, that brings about righteousness in the lives of the participators in that covenant. And therefore, it's far exceeding in the glory The ministry of righteousness far exceeds the glory of the ministry of condemnation. Paul will even go as far to say that it is as if the old covenant has no glory at all. Look at verse 10. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. Because of how great the glory of the new is, because of how much better this new covenant is, it makes it seem as if the old no longer has any glory. Now, we've been talking a lot about glory. What does glory mean? Well, I think what Paul's getting at is that the old covenant revealed some of who God is. That's what it, that's what it means by glory. It's a, it's a revealing of who God is. So that in the ministry of death, it revealed an aspect of who God God was, but, but the Israelites could not look at Moses' face because its glory shined too brightly because of their sin and their hardness of heart. They could not look at the glory. They could not look at how God has revealed himself. But now the new covenant has come and it reveals far much more of who God is and we can now look and behold the glory. And so because because this glory now reveals much more of who God is, it's almost as if the, 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 what once had glory has no longer has glory. You know, this idea of kind of something far surpassing in glory, making 
the, the past things seem as if it has no glory at all is, is very common in our, in our life. I, I was thinking this week of kind of football records. I'm a, I'm a big football fan. And so when Peyton Manning broke the record of most passing touchdowns, it made Brett, Brett Favre's record as if it was almost nothing. It kind of reduced the greatness, not in its actual sense. What Brett Favre did was incredible, but because, but because Peyton Manning had gone so much farther and above what Brett Favre had done, it made it seem as if Brett Favre was as nothing. And so I think that's what Paul's saying. It's not as if the old covenant doesn't have glory. It's not as if it doesn't reveal something of who God is, but because it is, it, the new covenant is so far surpassing what has happened in the old covenant, it makes it seem as if the old covenant no longer has glory. But then verse 11 comes to help us understand why the glory of the new covenant is so much better than that of the old covenant. Paul says, For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. As Paul contrasts one more time with this if and then statement, he describes the old covenant as that which was being brought to an end. It was a temporary covenant. It was a shadow of the things to come. It was never meant to be uh, the, the permanent covenant. Rather, now the permanent thing has come. The new covenant has come in Christ, and its glory is far more greater than that which was brought to an end. You know, the New Testament tells us again and again of how the, the old covenant was something that would lead us to a greater covenant. So Galatians 3, 24 and 20 through 26 and Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 each kind of teach us that the old covenant was, was like a guardian, a temporary placeholder until Christ came with the new covenant through which we become sons of God, no longer under the temporary guardian, but being adopted by our Father. That's Galatians 3. God has, has revealed himself now in the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the exact imprint of the nature of God, which is why this new covenant in Christ has so much more glory. Because Jesus reveals so much more of who God is because he is the radiance of the glory of God revealing the exact nature of God in a way that the Old Covenant could not and was not meant to do. So what, what's Paul getting at here? Why is, why is he talking about the glory of the Old and the glory of the New? Well, his argument is, is that the Old Covenant had glory even though it was a temporary covenant, a temporary covenant and a ministry of death and condemnation. But now the new covenant has come and its ministry is much better and its glory is much greater. Therefore, we have hope. See, that's what we see in verse 12, that we now have hope, a great hope, an undying hope, as 1 Peter 1.3 tells us. And the hope that we have in a new covenant is, is not some wishful thinking. We're not kind of looking to the future as they were in the old covenant, kind of hoping and, and, and waiting for the Messiah to come. Rather, we have seen the Messiah come. Jesus has come. And so we have a far greater hope, a, a supreme confidence in the divine realities of this new covenant. Friends, we have hope that we can know God. Now, I think that's one of the, one of the main applications as we, as we consider kind of verses 7 through 12, is that we have hope that we can know God, that he has revealed himself to us in a way in which we can know and understand because of his spirit. We can know God. I wonder if you've come here this morning and you were wondering if you could know God. He's revealed himself. He's, he's made his glory known in this new covenant in Christ. Not only can we know God, but we have hope that no matter what our circumstances are, no matter, no matter what our circumstances may tell us, that, that nothing can take away our hope. I mean, Romans 8 here is a great encouragement, something we, we should go to often in reminding ourselves of the hope that we have. A hope that is unchanged and undying. A hope in something that is, that is immortal. And while now invisible, will one day be made known in its fullness. We have hope. 
But this hope leads us to boldness. And that's what Paul will move into as he moves into the end of verse 12 and into verse 18, that, that this hope gives him a boldness that comes as God has removed the veil through the work of Jesus Christ. And so we now see then our, our boldness with unveiled face, our boldness with, with unveiled face. So just as Paul's theological ground for his hope was found in the glory of the new covenant. The way God has revealed himself now in the new covenant is is much greater than he had before. Paul continues his discussion of Exodus 34 and says, not only do we have a greater hope, but we now can be bold, unlike uh, Moses and having to cover his face. So verse 12 really serves as this transition, bringing a conclusion to the first section, but bringing us into the main idea that Paul's boldness in his letter and the general feel of his ministry is not to be doubted, but rather his boldness is the very effect of the new covenant. We are very bold since we have such a hope. What does Paul mean by boldness, right? So we talked about, about it in the, in the beginning, in the introduction, that it's not kind of this audacious or brazen or presumptuous. It's not any of the negative ways we might understand boldness. It's not out of pride in ourselves, but rather I think what Paul means by boldness here is he can speak plainly. You know, I I think this is exemplified in toddlers. Toddlers speak very matter-of-factly, right? My my daughter exercises this kind of boldness when she very matter-of-factly points out that my belly has gotten bigger, (laughs) she's not seeking to be mean in any way, but she's just speaking plainly. It's true, daddy's belly has gotten a little bigger. He likes ice cream. But in the same way, but of something so much more significant, Paul says that he can speak plainly. He can speak boldly. He can speak the truth in love. He does not have to hide the message of Christ because in the greater glory of the new covenant, the spirit of God has come and is able to take the word and apply it to the hearts of his people. He can take the plain message of the gospel and make it something in the hearts of God's people in a way in which was not able to be done during the time of Moses. Oh, friends, I think as I was just thinking about this, as as we're looking for a pastor, we're looking for someone who will boldly proclaim the gospel truth. Someone who's not going to kind of hide the message and fluff it up, but someone who's going to speak very plainly of the gospel. But it also means for us, for those who are now in the new covenant, participators in the new covenant through Christ, that we are not to be afraid to speak boldly. That we are to speak the truth plainly in an effort to see others come to know Christ and to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we have such a hope. Because we know that no matter what happens to us here, our hope is in the fact that we will see the fullness of the glory of God because Christ has already revealed that to us and is revealing it to us. Our hope fuels our boldness in speaking the message of the gospel. Well, as we, as we move then into verse 13, in, in, in verses 13 through 15, I think we've come to the, the hardest section to kind of understand of, the, of Paul's argument. And so let's make some observations as we seek to understand verses 13 through 15, where Paul writes, not like Moses, so we are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened, for to this day when they read the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. What is, what is Paul trying to teach us? What is he, he trying to communicate to us? Well, first, I think as we look at verse 13, we need to recognize that nothing negative is being said about Moses. That Paul's, that, that Paul's not looking at Moses and saying, ha, look how much better I am than Moses. He was not even able to be bold. Rather, what Paul is doing is he's making an observation that Moses had to veil his face as the protection of God's people. That Moses had to veil his face because of the sinfulness of their people. Because of their sin, which is highlighted for us in Exodus 32 in the golden calf. 
God had hardened their hearts so that if they saw the glory of God, it would have destroyed them. I think that's why we can say they were afraid in Exodus 34 as they begin to see the glory of the Lord reflected off of Moses' face. And so Moses put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze on the glory of the Lord and face their judgment and destruction. This is what Paul means when he says, so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome. The outcome is the judgment. It is their death from seeing the glory of the Lord, even in the temporary covenant, even in in the way that he has revealed himself temporarily, so that it's not the, the full glory, even in that little glory that he's revealed to himself. They saw it. They were going to die. And so Moses puts a veil over his face to protect them. And so rather than than being able to look at the glory of God, their minds were hardened, right? Instead of being able to to gaze at the glory on Moses' face, God hardened Israel's hearts. This idea of divine hardening, hardening can be a very difficult one to understand. And so I've put some references behind me on the screen of of Deuteronomy 29 and Isaiah 6 and Acts 28 and, and Romans 11. Each of these references kind of helping us to see how God was using the hardening of Israel to bring about the purpose and plan of his new and better covenant through the work of Jesus. But the hardness that came on Israel was because of their sins so that they could not gaze at the outcome rather, or they would be judged. And then Paul makes this comment, for to this day, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted. See, this this divine hardening still exists for all seeking to live and be justified by the law. That's what we see in verses 14 and 15. It's only through Christ that it's taken away. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. What Paul's saying is is not that we shouldn't read the the Old Testament. Not that what when we read Moses and uh, and the prophets and the writings that we'll never be able to understand them because a veil is covering them. Rather, what he's saying is when those who, who kind of give themselves to, to trying to justify themselves by their own actions as they read the law of Moses, they still have a veil and are unable, unable to see the glory of God, to see how God has revealed himself. Because even in the Old Covenant, as we see through, through Christ, through the lens of Christ, we see that God was always working to bring about Jesus. And so as those who then have the new covenant, who have the spirit, they can read. The veil has been taken away so that through Christ they can read the Old Testament and understand how God has revealed himself. I hope you're tracking with with that. It it took me all week to understand what what Paul is, is saying here. What he's saying is is for those who who are apart from Christ, they cannot read the Old Covenant and understand what it's pointing them to. They cannot see the glory of God. They cannot see how God has revealed himself. Rather, they they see it as a way in which they need to justify themselves before God. But in the New Covenant, as we'll read, when one turns to the Lord, that veil is removed. They can read it through the lens of Christ and through the illumination of the Spirit. There is both freedom to understand what God was speaking, and then to speak boldly. And so Paul, he says, yes, even to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. I think Paul's probably specifically talking still about Jews, but it's applicable to all of us. When, when apart from Christ, all of us in some way are seeking to justify ourselves. So if you have not believed in Christ, you still have a veil. You cannot see the glory of God that is only removed by the Spirit, as you believe in Jesus. Friends, the Old Covenant could not change hearts. Remember, it, it could only condemn. It was a ministry of death and condemnation, not of the Spirit and of righteousness. And so even now the veil remains in all who do not know the life-giving Spirit. They are unable to gaze upon the glory of the Lord. But Paul, on the other hand, unlike Moses can be very bold. On the other hand, because 
Paul ministers a better covenant, a covenant of the Spirit and of righteousness, a covenant marked by the coming of the Spirit and the enabling of righteousness. Paul can speak boldly. He does not have to mince words, but can speak with boldness in an effort to see spiritual growth. Moses could not be bold, but Paul can now be bold, and the the reason why lies in the Spirit of God. The reason Paul could speak with boldness has nothing to do with himself, but because now God in his new covenant works through the Spirit of God. We read Ezekiel 36 for our, uh, our, our assurance of forgiveness, where God promises that he will send his Spirit and cause us to obey his rules. So Paul can speak boldly in a way that Moses could never do because the Spirit has come and indwelled all who have believed in Christ. The Spirit has come and he has enabled us to gaze on the glory of the Lord. So Christian, are you afraid to speak boldly? Remember that you've been given the Spirit and that in the Spirit you can speak boldly of Christ and trust that those who hear and, and that the Spirit would work in those whom he wills to work in. So friends, be bold in your speech, not out of your pride, not out of a, a presumption that you, have, you know everything and that you're able to, 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 to speak clearly, but rather speak because the Spirit of God has enabled you to gaze on the glory of the Lord and is now using you to, pro, to proclaim that message that will allow many to gaze on the glory of the Lord. Speak boldly in Christ and through the Spirit. But I think this also means something for when we are, when we are spoken boldly to. You know, as, as we think as, as New Covenant Christians, when we're spoken boldly to, I wonder how you handle that, that kind of correction, that kind of frank criticism. You know, the church should be marked by this kind of ability to speak boldly, but also take, uh, take criticism and take bold speech back. So Paul says that his boldness is because of the Spirit of God, because the veil has been removed. And so that leads us into our next question as we look at verses 16 through 18. How is this, the veil removed? Well, as Paul has already said in verse 13, 14, sorry, that it's removed through faith in Christ as enabled by the Spirit who brings freedom. It's removed for the one who turns to the Lord because they believed in Jesus and has been enabled to do this by the Holy Spirit. So verse 16, where, where Paul says, but one who turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Paul, what Paul's doing there is he's kind of citing, kind of very loosely, I, I might say, he's citing verse 34. And in doing that, he's interpreting and, and applying it to us. So in, in verse 34 of Exodus 34, what, Paul, what we see is that Moses would, re, would remove the veil every time he entered into the presence, right? So it, it says that every time he entered into the presence, he would remove the, veil of the, uh, remove the veil that covered his face. And what Paul is saying is, so too now, all who have turned to Christ in faith, have that veil removed. So just as Moses would remove the veil when you go into the presence of the Lord, all those who believe in Jesus can now remove the veil, not out of their own action, but but Christ removing it for them. The Spirit doing that work in their heart. When one turns to the Lord, now the Lord is the Spirit. As, As one turns to the Lord God, the Spirit removes the veil because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Friends, the veil is removed because of what Christ has accomplished. Matthew 27, we read of Christ's death. And as Christ dies and breathes his last, we read, starting in Matthew 27, 51, that behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. See, in Christ's death, the the veil, the curtain in the temple has been torn down, not only physically, but that represents a spiritual state. Because Jesus has, in his death, bore the wrath of God as a substitute for all who believe in him, we are now able to gaze upon the Lord. Friends, what we, what we see in this passage is that in and of ourselves, we are not able to look at the glory of the Lord without dying because of our sin and because of God's holiness. 
but because of what Christ has done in living the perfect life and then going to the cross and bearing the wrath of God as a substitute, all who turn to Christ have the veil removed. In Christ, those whose hearts were hardened are unhardened through the work of the Spirit of God. The coming of Christ and the coming of the Spirit has brought about a new covenant in which everyone who turns to the Lord because of the work of the Spirit is now like Moses, able to gaze on the glory of the Lord. That everyone who turns to the Lord, where the Spirit of the Lord is now, there is freedom. Not just freedom for, uh, from the law, but freedom to speak boldly. Not just freedom from, from the law, but freedom from death. Freedom to look and gaze upon the glory of the Lord. Friends, if you are here this morning and you've never believed in Jesus, you are still in your sin. The, the, the veil still remains because you cannot even gaze on the lesser glory of God without perishing. Your, your sin keeps you from God because he is a just and a holy God. But the beauty of the gospel is that because of Christ's work, the Spirit comes and enables us to turn to the Lord. So friend, if you are here, turn to God and do so through faith in Jesus and repentance of your sin. Do so enabled by the Spirit. Do not continue on in your sin. Do not continue on in your hardness, but hear the warning that everything is not okay and turn to the Lord through faith in Jesus and repentance of your sin. You know, if you're here this morning and you've never believed in Jesus, I would love to talk with you after the service. I want to encourage you to not leave today without talking to someone. As we think about this idea that the, the veil is removed as one turns to the Lord through, through the Spirit of the Lord being freedom, it reminds us that we are to remember that it was only through the work of Jesus that we can now look and behold the glory of the Lord. You know, in a few minutes, we're going to partake in communion. And as we do that, we are remembering that the veil has been removed, that we can gaze upon the glory of the Lord in Christ. And we can speak boldly to each other and to others. Well, as Paul kind of, as Paul moves into verse 17, we've talked of, of where the Spirit of the Lord, there's freedom. That's freedom not only from the law, but to speak boldly. And then verse 18, Paul turns and says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. As Paul brings to a conclusion this portion of his argument, he turns to each and every Christian. That's what the reference of we all means. It's we all. It's, it's all believers, not, not a few, not to him just as an apostle, but to every believer who is now through Christ and through the Spirit able to with unveiled face behold the glory of the Lord just as Moses did except in a far greater and far better way because we look to Jesus who is the exact imprint of his nature. And yet, even now, the, the ESV doesn't say it, but uh, I think it's there in, in, in the Greek text that beholding the glory of the Lord in a mirror. So 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, For we now see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall now fully, even as I have been fully known. So, so even now, as we look into the mirror of Christ, we're not even seeing the full glory of God. We're still waiting for that day when he will come and reign as king and we will see his glory in the fullness. But even now we see far greater than what those in the old covenant could because we look to Christ and one day we will see him fully. Now this, this is kind of as Paul is talking about this and beholding the glory of the Lord and, and what that means. He, he then says we are, we are then able to be transformed. Not just able, we are being transformed. It's it's. It's a present tense, are being transformed into the same image. The same image of, of, of who? Well, of Christ. From one degree of glory to another. Friends, beholding the glory of the Lord leads to transformation of our likeness. Not just, not physically as it did with Moses where his face shone, but now we become more Christ-like. We look more like Christ than we did before, and we do this with the hope that one day we will be made perfect, glorified, going from one degree of glory to another. And all of this, Paul says, comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Well, friends, what, what does this mean for us? Especially as we look at verse 18. 
Well, I think as Paul kind of talks about this idea that now in the new covenant, we can behold the glory of the Lord. He kind of gives us three kind of applications to how we are to think about transformation and sanctification. First, as Paul thinks about sanctification and transformation in verse 318, he says that every believer is to be transformed. You know, we talked about this. We all is not limited. It's for all people. This is for the Corinthian church and the church in general. Every believer is to be is being transformed. See, our, our doctrine of, of conversion is not that it's just this one-time decision where we make a one-time response, but rather it's a constant transforming of the heart and mind rather than a conforming to the world. So brothers and sisters, are you being transformed? Do you see fruit in your life that was not there before? Not that it's always as fast as we want it, but if you've had the veil removed and you're able to gaze upon the glory of the Lord, you are being transformed. Secondly, we see not only is every believer being transformed, but transformation happens as we behold the glory of the Lord. Transformation happens as we behold the glory of the Lord. Friends, there's not like this one, two, three steps of sanctification. Like, it's not just, if you do this, this, and this, you're going to be transformed. What Paul says is that as we are transformed, just as Moses was, by gazing on the glory of the Lord. The question is, are you gazing on the glory of the Lord? Are you beholding that glory? And what does that look like to gaze on the glory of the Lord even this week? Well, I think kind of the primary application there is, is to read the Bible. That God has made his glory known in Christ, and, and we see Christ clearly in the word of God. So we are to be diligent to gaze on the glory of the Lord as we look to his word this week. And finally, we see of, of sanctification, transformation, that it is a work of the Spirit of God. See, friends, there's hope in this that you and I cannot make ourselves change. True transformation comes from the Spirit of God. You know, Philippians 2 highlights both that we do have a responsibility to work out our salvation, but we we do that only as God works it out in us. Paul says that this transformation comes from the Lord who is Spirit. Brothers and sisters, the new covenant has, has been marked by this new work of the Spirit to indwell us, to transform us, enabling us to live righteous lives, never perfect in this life, but always growing into the same image of Him, of who we are beholding. So as we think about verse 318, we are, we are to understand that every believer is to be transformed, that tr- transformation happens as we gaze on the glory of the Lord, and that transformation is ultimately a work of the Spirit. Paul says he can be bold in his ministry. He's free to, free to speak clearly and boldly because as believers, the veil has been removed and the Spirit is now working to change hearts. So we can speak boldly, not because of anything in us, but because of the Spirit who is now working to change hearts in a way that wasn't happening with the Old Covenant. So therefore, he's able to speak boldly because he is the hope brought about by the greater glory of the New Covenant. Well, friends, in all of this, we have seen that the greater glory of the new covenant gives hope to believers that they may boldly proclaim the gospel as they are being transformed into the likeness of Jesus. Friends, if if you believe in Jesus and repent of your sin, you participate in a better covenant, one that is marked by the giving of the Spirit who enables righteousness so that we might gaze upon the glory of the Lord. So this week, brothers and sisters, speak boldly, not not of, of, of your own desires to promote your own desires, but rather because you have seen how God has revealed himself to you in Christ. You've gazed upon the glory of the Lord. And so now we want to help others do the same. What a great joy and privilege it is to participate in this new covenant ministry as we boldly proclaim the gospel. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us. That you have made known who you are as we look upon Christ in faith. What a joy and a privilege we have in Christ. This, 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 uh, this afternoon, we pray that you would assure us of our greater hope in this new covenant. A hope that's not mere wishful thinking, but a hope that is confidently grounded in the work of Jesus. Fuel our hope, and as you do that, give us confidence to boldly proclaim the gospel.
in this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.